Hey, South Hills, did you know we have eight values as a church? These values define who we desire to be as a collective church and as individual followers of Christ. So I thought it would be great to take some time to share these values and what they really mean with all of you. The value I wanna unpack today is this. We are intentional about becoming personally and collectively healthy. Have you ever heard the phrase, health is wealth? It's a simple yet powerful statement that highlights the importance of taking care of ourselves. Growing up, many of us were taught that success, image, or making money were the ultimate goals. But the truth is that achieving these goals won't necessarily make us happy or healthy for that matter. God wants each of us to live fulfilling lives. But to do that, we need to be intentional about well-being. This means making conscious choices to prioritize our physical, emotional, mental, relational, and spiritual health. At the heart of this journey is the recognition that our community or our church can only be as healthy as we are individually. This means that we need to prioritize our own health to be able to contribute to our community's health. We can't give what we don't have. So if we want to create a healthy and thriving community, we need to start with ourselves. A great starting place is spending time and applying scripture to our attitudes, our motives, self-talk, and our daily habits. We believe that changing the world begins by partnering with God and changing ourselves. It's not enough to just read the Bible. We need to actively apply it to our lives. As we do this, we cultivate a healthy mindset that empowers us to live a fulfilling life and contribute positively to those around us. So this week, I'm challenging us all to take a simple action step. Think about an area of your health that needs improvement. This could be physical, emotional, mental, relational, or spiritual. Some of us might need to combat a lie we've been hanging on to. Others could be looking for encouragement to bolster their faith. Find a scripture that speaks to your situation and write it down on a piece of paper, then stick it somewhere where you can see it regularly. Every time you see the verse, speak it over yourself, meditate on it, maybe even take some time to memorize it, and notice how you start to cultivate a new, healthier mindset. At the end of the day, my prayer is that we would all be intentional about our health and work towards creating a healthy and thriving community together. The Bible is a tough read. It's complex, cryptic, and confusing. Even if you know some of the stories, how do they all fit together? How does the average person make sense of this ancient book? And what does it have to do with us? Well, as you can see, we're starting a new series, Four Short Words, and I know that some of you are probably thinking four-letter words, but guys, come on, it's church, okay? So we're sticking to the four short, short words that describe uh, the Bible, and this might be different for some of us, because maybe we've heard all of the stories in the Bible. Maybe we've heard so many things. Maybe we've grown up in it. Even if you haven't grown up in it, there's a lot of little stories in the Bible that you can kind of point to that you can say, oh, sure, I know about David and Goliath. I know about Noah's Ark. I know about Jesus and the cross. I may not know all the details, but no matter where you are in your faith, you've heard something about the Bible. And it's really hard to get into a subject of, well, let's break it all down into just a very short story or four small words or four short words, however you want to put it together. Um, but we're going to do our best to add a little bit of a different flair to it this month. And the four words are kind of funny. They're of, between, through, and in. And throughout this month, we're going to talk about what those four words mean and how to describe the Bible in just four simple words. What does it mean? Well, here's the thing. Today, the word is of. And this will give you kind of a prelim for what's coming up. But today, the word is of. And the very simple statement that we're basing this on is we were created in the image of God. He planned you and I before the world began. We are of him of his spirit. Think about it this way. Every life is a miracle, and every miracle is by his spirit. Yesterday at men's breakfast, we talked about identity. In our discussion time, <clears throat> we asked, what's the best description of our identity? 
What, what would be the best description of an identity, of a man who follows Christ, of a good, godly man, of somebody who says, I don't <clears throat> want to be defined as just a, I don't know, my career, maybe my occupation. Maybe some of us say, I'm fine with just being defined as a father. I'm fine with just being defined as a husband. But does that really, truly define who you are deep down at the core of who you were created to be? And yesterday we asked that question and there was a few different answers and I myself even said, I think that you know, my main calling, my main purpose in life is to encourage the body, to encourage the church, to encourage those who follow Christ. But still, and then somebody said something after me and said, you know, <clears throat> I think the best description would be a man of God. And we were all sitting there and it was like, yeah, that's probably the best one. Good job, Mike. That's it, you know? And so we thought about that for a second. We talked about it. It was part of the discussion. And when our identity is found in him, when our identity comes from him and our relationship with him, it defines everything about what we do. See, a lot of us take what we do and make it who we are. But I think God is the opposite of that. God says, hold on. I would like you to find out who you are. I would like you to pursue me and discover who you are in me, who I created you to be. Then your actions will proceed from that. But obviously some would say here in this room, well, okay, well, then does that make me a woman of God, a child of God, born of his spirit, washed in his, anybody know that old song? Blood. Um, but no matter who we are, our definition comes from God. We are of God, made in the image of the God of all creation. The very reason why saying that we're of him is so powerful, that we have complete assurance, security, and blessings when we put him first in our lives. Here's a great truth. You were created in the image of God to live with purpose and at peace with him and others. Say, well, that, is that like the great, the great purpose? Is that what, what we're supposed to do? In essence, that's what he created in the beginning. That's what God created. He created us to have community with him and community with others. <clears throat> Romans 12 says, if at all possible, if it depends on you, be at peace with all. Romans 5 says, be at peace with God. Ephesians 4 says, maintain the unity in the spirit with the bond of peace. And one of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Peace is a process. It's a process of knowing who you come from, whose you are, who you're becoming, and who's in control. And I'll break that down in just a second, but I want to read you something. If you can start the day without caffeine... If you can always be cheerful, ignoring aches and pains, if you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, if you can eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, if you can understand when your loved ones are too busy to give you any time, if you can take criticism and blame without resentment, if you can conquer tension without medical help, if you can relax without alcohol, if you can sleep without the aid of drugs, then you are probably the family dog. You thought I was going to go spiritual with that one, huh? I mean, but honestly, unlike that little joke right there, God actually makes it possible when we allow him to work in and through us. In and through are two of the words that we'll be going through this month. And I can't wait to break down this month. I'm excited when, when it's a series on just the Bible. And that's what this is. This series is just on the Bible and how we can relate it to our lives even maybe more simple than we do right now. Many of us in this room are, die hard. We're ready. God, I'm, I'm here. I, make me your servant. Here I am, send me. But there's also many of us in here that say, man, I would love to be that way, but a lot of it is just like, I feel like it's hard to understand. It's hard to grasp it. And I'll tell you this. When I think of peace as a process, I think of this little formula right here, and I want to share this with you because I feel like God laid this on my heart, is, is that trust 
equals confidence, which equals peace, which equals joy, which equals strength, and equals victory. The only way any of that is possible is understanding the idea of being in the image of. And I want to read from Genesis chapter 1, and I'm sure many of us have heard this little portion of Scripture, but to dig into it, let's read it this morning. If you've got a Bible, you can open up your Bibles. If you want to follow on the screen, you can follow on the screen, but here we go. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28 goes like this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And I think the most important part here that we're looking at this morning is the idea of that in the image of, in the likeness of. And he says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And he's talking to, if you go to John 1, 1, it says... In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh, meaning that Jesus was a part of this. When God the Father was time to create, he said, let us make mankind in our image. And as Christians, we believe in a triune God. We believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God that's in each one of us. So we were made in the image of a triune God. We were made in his image. What does that mean? In HTML language, to portray a correct image, you have to have the right attribute. Some of you might know that. Some of you are like, I have no idea what that means. I didn't really know what that means until I saw it and I was like, wow, that's an incredible fact. So an image has attributes and if you and I are in the image of God, then we gotta have his attributes. Otherwise, his image isn't reflected correctly might get somewhat of an image, might be blurry, might not really look, you might not be able to define it. We have to have his attributes to be able to reflect his image. Now I think, I think we need to understand something. He's still the source of power. We just get to be the ones he displays it through. Does that make sense? To have all of the attributes of God to be created in his image, in the likeness of him, but yet he's still the source of power. So we have access to that. We have the ability to work in that and for that power to work through us, but he's still the source of that power. We were talking about this and pretty amazing to think that <clears throat> God displays his power through people. He always has. He uses us to open the door to the opportunity for the miracle. Nothing happens unless you pray for it or unless you ask for it. The word says, you have not because you ask not. You haven't asked. The only way we can see God do a miracle in our lives or God do a work in our lives is if we ask, if we pray, if we present him with the need. Think about this. We know the story of the five loaves and the two fish. <clears throat> But do we ever think about the boy that brought that to Jesus? He's not really in the story much. The little boy who brought the five loaves and the two fish, God needed those things to do the miracle, to feed the 5,000. How about the ones who filled the wine vats with water? Somebody had to do it, right? Jesus said, go fill them with water and I'll do a miracle. The nobleman who sought out Jesus to heal his daughter, Jairus, who begged him at his feet to heal his daughter, the unclean woman who grabbed him by his garment. It takes an action from us for God to display his power, but he wants to do it through us, and he wants to do it with us as a partner. We partner with God in everything that we do in life. If you want God to do something, you gotta bring it to him. 
He hears our prayers, he uses us, and he chooses to work through us and our efforts. When you start to get the picture of who we really are and who God is, you take a different perspective on everything and everyone. Last week, we talked about loving others the way God loves us. In fact, we've been talking about it for a few weeks now, and I'd like to point to something. When you're not clear on what you're of, instead of living from, you live in response to. When you're not clear on what you're of, instead of living from, you live in response to. You'll never truly know who you are until you truly know who you are of. Jesus, when he was crucified on the cross, beaten and tortured, said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I would imagine you could look at that from a few different perspectives and from the simple perspective of that they didn't know that he truly was God. So maybe he was just saying, he was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do because they don't know that I'm Jesus. They don't know that I'm, I am truly God. But I think it's a little deeper than that. The phrase moral compass has been popping up more and more lately. It's been in a lot of conversations. And let me tell you, with great confidence, there is no moral compass without God. None of the laws, rules, anything that we have in this world has come from anywhere but the Bible that we follow, the word that we read. Every thriving community on earth was founded on biblical principles. Look it up. Everything good comes from God. There is no way to be good. Some of us would still say, but, but can't we still just be decent people? Like, can't we just be nice people, good people? My question would be, why? Why would you do that? If you have no heart for others, if it's, it's all gonna come back to you, eventually it's gonna be selfish ambition. It's gonna be, I gotta protect myself and I gotta take care of me. Because the only thing in this world that truly says to love others unconditionally is the word of God. So in all essence, no matter what, even if we try as hard as we can to do it in our own standards without God, eventually you're gonna have to take a selfish stand. Eventually you're gonna have to find yourself is the most important person in your life. And I, I know that many of us would say, well, isn't that, isn't that true for us here? Yes, you have to take care of yourself to be able to take care of anybody else around you. But to take care of yourself takes an act of humility. It takes an act of surrender to say, God, I surrender my life to you. So I am submitted to your authority. I'm submitted to all your principles. I'm submitted to your plans and purposes because I know what they'll do for my life and for those around me. The enemy wants us to believe that the desires that we have naturally, even if we have some decent desires to care for other people or we want to be benevolent in some way or another, the enemy would like us to think that those desires are just, they're just normal, they're just good. But without God, they'll be used against us every time. Every time, that's what the enemy will do. He'll present something that's almost good, almost God. And we go, look, see, this is perfect. This is, this is good for me. And then before you know it, you're in trouble and you go, what happened? What happened? Where did I go wrong? James 1, verses 16 through 18 says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. We're the first fruits of what he created. Birth by his spirit in the word of truth. You and I were created of truth. We were created in the image of God. There's so many ways to frame it and look at it. When you start to pursue God and you start to see who he is, you see who Jesus was even on the cross and you say, that's what I'm working towards. That's great success in my mind. That's what I desire most. 
Anything that's good comes from him. Let me try that again. Everything that's good comes from him. So how do we start representing him and his image today? For many of us, it might be forgiveness. A lot of times, that's where it starts. We're hurt. We've got anger. We've got built walls. We've got so many things, and it's so hard to get to God because we've built those up to protect us from others, but yet they're keeping us from God because his very desire is is that we have unity in the bond of peace. For some, it might be asking for forgiveness. For all of us, it'll be a process. And remember this. You're only responsible for your own actions. We are only responsible for our own actions. Let me give you a remedy for when you want to love someone the way God does when they've hurt you. Address the anger in yourself. Acknowledge the wound and allow the healing. It's very simple, and maybe that first one is address the hurt. Maybe you haven't built it up to anger yet. Maybe it's still just a hurt. But for most of us, that hurt becomes an anger. It becomes a bitterness. It becomes something that we hold against the person that hurt us. But if we address it, and we say, that's not who I'm called to be. That's not who I'm of. And acknowledge the wound. It's there. I know it. I get it. I understand. I'm not just going to forget about it. It is just wiped clean because it makes us who we are, even the wounds that we have. And then allow the healing. That's as simple as it is. That's the way God works. God says, if you point to me, if you focus on me, address your issues, your anger, your hurt, anything. Acknowledge what's happened in your life and then allow me to take control and allow me to heal you. Forgiveness is an intentional invitation for God's grace to intervene. You're intentionally saying, God, please, you come take care of this because I can't handle it. Because I can't. Because I'm not good enough without you. It starts to make a little bit more sense when we think about the people that have hurt us. Because we can say, well, I'm I'm a good person. But when somebody hurts you, what would be the natural response? Most of the time, we would either be hurt back, cut off, get rid of, disown. We could keep going, but that's not the way God works. God says, forgive. Forgive. Acknowledge the wound, of course, and allow me to heal. And I'll create something in you that's far greater than your bitterness will ever create. Jesus is the very definition of what God created humanity for. When you realize that you start to understand the word a whole lot more. When we say the word again, the word is the Bible. It's the word of God, but it's also the word in the flesh, which is Jesus. So everything, we have an example to look to. We have a manual to read. We have everything at our fingertips. Jesus didn't just die to his own self. He physically sacrificed his life. And when he did physically, he made way for us to do the same spiritually. What we do in the spirit, God brings to the natural. Our faith in him starts with our foundation in him. Do you know who you are? Feels like it's such a simple question, but do we really believe that we were created in the image of God, that we were birthed from his spirit, that we're of him. We can think of a mother who births a child, and we can think, well, of course. I mean, that baby was in there, was feeding off mom for nine months. Birth of, I am of, I mean, there's so many things that you could look at and say, I'm, as much as I'd like to say I'm not like my mom, I find a lot of things that I'm like my mom in. I know where I'm from in this world, but do we know that in that same way that God birthed all of creation in his image and in his likeness? 
And if you dig into the Hebrew in it, it's as if he created us from his side, that he took from himself and birthed us. I know it says dust of the earth, but the way the Hebrew frames it says that we were created from him, birthed out of him. I believe that we need to start speaking that over our lives. Claim who we are. Claim his lordship, his plans, and his purpose, his peace, and his image over our lives and the lives of those around us. There's one takeaway I'd like us all to take with us this week. At all of our campuses, we have an action item that we believe is helpful. Some of us like to write things down. Some of us like to take a picture. Some of us like to take it throughout the week and see if it actually helps us in our lives. But here's the one thing that I believe might help us this week is is that identify something you say to yourself that you think might conflict with what God says about you. Tell someone who loves both God and you and ask them to help you align your view of you with God's. It's a simple way of accountability. We talk about accountability not being a judgmental accountability, but an accountability that encourages each other, that says, I know what you're going through, that doesn't always offer up advice, that sometimes just offers a listening ear, maybe a crying shoulder, Accountability, I don't believe, is the same as what some of us might think. We need to be accountable. We need to stop these things, stop those things. Yes, there's plenty of things that we need to stop in our lives, but only because we know what God has for us on the other side. If God has something great for each and every one of us on the other side, if he truly created each and every one of us in his image, then he cares about us more than we can imagine. If you're a parent in this room, you understand the love for a child. And some of us have made plenty of mistakes as parents. I can look back at situations and think, man, that wasn't very loving. But did it take away from my love for my kids? Absolutely not. You would do anything for them. You would probably most likely give your life for them. Most of us, if it were a choice to be made, absolutely no questions asked, I'd give my life for them. And that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what God did. He sacrificed everything for us. Don't you think he's got great reward on the other side of trusting him? Don't you think he has great blessing on the other side of confidence in him? Roger, would you put that back up again, the trust Trust equals confidence. I'm going to go back to it. Trust equals confidence equals peace equals joy equals strength equals victory. Our trust in him brings us to a place where we can be confident in who he is in our lives and who we are in him, giving us peace no matter what. That peace translates to joy because when you're at peace, life is great. Then you can truly have joy, a happiness that's not found without peace. And the word says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So when joy comes upon us, strength is given. And when we have strength, we know the victory is just on the other side. It's not easy to understand everything in the Bible. It's not easy to understand all of what God has called us to and what he expects of us, what he hopes of us. But when we take it in short form and just say, let's just take small steps in this. Take one step at a time. This week, think about how you think of yourself. Maybe the self-talk you have or however you present yourself, your image, your identity. And think of how God might think of you. And find somebody that you trust and say, hey, here's where I'm at. I want you to help me be accountable in this. I need you to help encourage me in this because I'm going to fail. But if we come together, like I said in the very beginning, the thing that I love most about this little corner is the community. 
I love Jesus with all my heart, and I want to do my best to encourage every one of you to get closer to him and to find the true goodness of the God we serve. And that's why I just love seeing the community that we have. I love seeing neighbors sitting at a table that they've never met and just chatting about life. How often do you do that throughout the week? How often do you do that in any event? How many opportunities for that come around? Not many. So we're going to make sure we do it every week. Every week we'll have an opportunity for us to be here and encourage each other in the bond of peace. That's what the word says, in the bond of peace. Keep the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. God has great things for each and every one of us, but we have to know that we are made in the image of the creator of all things. He loves us, each and every one of us, as his own child. And think of every bit of love that you could muster up, that you could figure out to give to somebody, and God loves us more than that. He loves us more than we could imagine. And he wants the best for each and every one of us. I want to do my best to look like him. I want to do my best to be a man of God. And my hope is is that you want to do the same, or a woman of God, a child of God. I was made in the image of God, and so were you. Let's believe in that this week. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for each and every person here. God, I thank you for calling them to this place like you called me, Lord. You've called each and every one of us to be here this morning. No matter what for, each of us is different, God. We have a different season we're in in life. But you know what it is, God, and you know why we're here this morning. You know what we need to be encouraged, God. And maybe some of us were encouraged by the message this morning. Maybe some of us will be encouraged by conversations outside. But Lord, I believe every bit of it is in your hands, God, and we trust you with our lives, our relationships, and our future, God. I pray that you bless each and every person here, God, and every home represented, Lord. And I just want to take a moment with every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's anybody in here who says, you know, I, I, I really would love to call myself a Christian. I would love to call myself a man of God or a woman of God, a child of God, but I don't know that I, I, I could identify as that. If that's you this morning, maybe you've never accepted Jesus into your life. You've never accepted God as your guide, Jesus as your Lord, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. You say, I've heard a lot of it, but I've never experienced it. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus and you say, I want that life. I want to know what I'm of, where I come from, and I want to have confidence in it. Whether you're here and this is the first time you've ever accepted Jesus or you're here and it's been a long, long time and you've walked far away and you know you need to come back, If you want to accept Jesus this morning with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you look up and make eye contact with me so I can be praying for you, praying with you? Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we just, we thank you so much for your goodness, God. I pray that each one of us, Lord, would come to you as your word says, like children, trusting in you, depending on you, giving you everything and saying, Lord, Lead me, guide me. Be my provider, be my source. Lord, bless each and every person here, God, every home represented, every family represented, every relationship represented. But most of all, God, I pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our 
our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.